there's so little that's expected of fathers in our culture, um, which boggles my mind. Um, and I think that it leaves men worse off, it leaves women worse off, and it leaves babies worse off. Worse off. I think that the amount that we expect from fathers is so minimal. Good day. Welcome to episode 57 of the Aaron Wayne Podcast. Oh yeah, here we go. Feels good to be back in it. Got a new microphone, got a new podcast recorder. It's a Zoom, no big deal. Hope you guys are doing well. I'm a dad. I'm almost a month into this, this dad life thing. In fact, uh, it's about one in the afternoon now. Baby had a snack and a nap, and I started recording a podcast a couple hours ago, uh, trying to get it done first thing in the morning, and uh, I got about 15 minutes into it. It was a crap podcast anyway, because I haven't done this in two months, but the podcast was cruising, and then I hear some hollering upstairs and some baby crying, so I went to check it out. Turns out my baby pooped all over my wife. My wife. So... (laughs) <laughs> that's the things man that's um you know people gave a lot of advice to us before we started having kids and uh it was before we had our kid we may or may not have another kid i think we might stick with one and kind of see how things go but you know people give a lot of advice they say you know you're not gonna sleep and um this that this that and we've been grooving man i'm on paternity leave right now being a public school teacher it's really nice because they um are pretty gracious with um how leave goes so i'm grateful for that i've taken um five weeks one week for like yeah and then i'm leaving uh, a week on the table in case i need that but yeah so i'm home kicking it katie is uh home until mid-february which like that is ideal she's gonna be here for um several months which is awesome but that creates a situation where you know we're like learning we're getting a chance to learn things like we've met with the pediatrician twice and she gave us a great advice on like feeding and diaper changing like timing that because um right now katie's uh breastfeeding and you know she'll fall asleep before she switches to the other side uh the baby will not katie but uh just trying to keep the baby awake, just like different strategies. We've just been like picking different things up and, um, it's been cool, man. It's been a real, like awesome learning process. And she's starting to smile and laugh and it's kind of far out. That's really cool, man. The, um, the labor of the labor of my wife, my wife, the, process of having a baby you don't realize how much of that is like sit and wait and we got to the hospital at like 6 a.m she was kind of grooving for a while uh they started to uh speed up the labor with um oxytocin or pitocin which i think is just a uh, lab derived oxytocin and we thought oh they're you know starting this process is we got two hours until we have a baby that was what we thought. What we didn't realize is we were still like 14 hours away from having a baby, 12 hours away from having a baby. So Katie was in active labor for 10 to 12 hours, which is just like a they, active active labor is just a certain amount of uh, centimeters uh, dilated. And, you know, back to the advice, people often give advice. People often give advice to uh, new parents and you don't realize that they're trying to articulate something that is almost like completely ineffable. It's like you can't really describe the experience. And I've been trying, I've been writing, I've been thinking, I've been trying to figure out how to articulate uh, some of these ideas of uh, parenthood and fatherhood specifically. But the one thing that I can articulate clearly is the labor process because people say, you know, um, you know, women are 
you, you don't realize how strong your your partner is until you see her go through labor and that is definitely true um i katie and i've been together for 20 years nearly and seeing that process was it can it fundamentally shifted the way that i think about my wife she was in active labor for like like i said like 10 or 12 hours but really the the action is more condensed than that and she was pushing for uh, three and a half hours so if you if you if you've never like seen been a part of the process of a baby being born you know we get this idea from media that it's a um you know an hour 30 minutes something like that and for a lot of women it is Katie pushed for three and a half hours. And then another idea that we get, or at least I had in my head from seeing movies and stuff is it's a, it's sort of like, okay, three, two, one, push. And then you do that and you kind of just push and then baby comes out. What you don't realize, and I, at least I didn't realize is that the actual like pushing process is like doing 10 second long intervals of squeezing every muscle in your body. So like if you were to, listening to this right now squeeze every muscle you can like katie's face was puffy that's how much musculature she was using she was using every muscle in her body for 10 seconds full clench for four reps every five minutes for three and a half hours it's insane like the average marathon time for like someone who's not an elite athlete i think is roughly four hours um Someone who's really fit could do a three and a half hour marathon, but that's just like a slow, sustained pace. It's not as hard as you can and then relax and then as hard as you can and then relax. And the breaks in between each of those like 10 second intervals is just enough time to take your breath out and back in. Um, It was incredibly impressive. It was so far out to see. Um, Another thing they don't tell you is that epidurals are really freaky. (laughs) Like, especially with my um, awareness of anatomy uh, because of yoga, the, and I was talking to the doctor after she gave the epidural and I was just like curious, like, are you going here? Are you going there? She ended up, uh, after the baby was born, she ended up showing me some graphics that she had on her phone. She had an anatomy app an an anatomy app. And, uh, she showed me like where the epidural goes in, but it's, uh, it's not a gimme, you know what I mean? It's definitely a a tense process. I think that was, you know, the, probably the second most intense part of the entire labor, which was just getting the epidural in. Um, so Katie pushed for like three and a half hours. Turns out my baby's got a big old noggin, just like her daddy. So, um, she ended up having to get an unplanned C-section after three and a half hours, which like wasn't part of our game plan. We were aware because a, a good friend of ours used to be a labor and delivery nurse. And so she sort of coached us like, this is what will happen if you have an unplanned C-section. And so, you know, it wasn't completely foreign to us, like what would happen, um, like how it would go. But, you know, they're like, all right, sign this, sign these papers. And dad, here's your scrubs. Meet us in the lobby in 30 minutes and um, we'll take you back. And then, you know, Katie is, uh, they take me into the room. Katie is like on the table, has like a blue sheet so that she and I can't see the actual surgery because um, it's it's a legit surgery. It's like a pretty far out surgery. Um, and you can learn more about that if you want to, if you go online. But um, it is, it's, it's a proper surgery. It took her two weeks to fully recover from it. So she... Um, was on the table and I was like, I walked in, scrubbed up. Actually, I was, I was wearing this shirt now that I look at myself in the camera. How about that? Hmm. Serendipity. And, um, you know, I'm talking her through it. It was highly emotional of that. And then we're just kind of talking to each other. I'm trying to keep her cool. Just chatting. I was freaking out, but, um, I think that Katie and I have been together, like I said, for 20 years. And I have a real capacity to, like, understand when she's uh, worried about something. And I don't think that she can tell when I am or I'm not worried. And so I was able to be calm, even though on the inside I was like, 
Holy shit, holy shit, holy shit, holy shit. <laughs> um, and then, you know, we're talking. Next thing you know, we hear a baby crying. And it was such an intense experience. It was such a relief um, after all of the, the work and then the fear of, you know, a C-section. Like, what could go right? What could go wrong? And then you hear the baby crying. And the first time I ever, I you know, someone can correct me. Um, I think none of my friends listen to this podcast, but whatever. If you're one of my friends and I have held your infant, uh, text me and say like, hey, no, Rico, you have, you held my baby. I don't remember ever having held an infant before. And they take Eleanor, our daughter, to the table, clean her up, cut her umbilical cord, which I was stoked to do. In fact, the midwife said, um, she was like, Dad, do you want to cut the umbilical cord? I was like, hell yeah. And then uh, later on, I was like in the process with Katie during the uh, pushing. And she was like, do you want to catch her? Like the baby? And I was like, yes, that would be crazy. I've made that joke in the past, like to Katie. Oh, when we have kids, I'm going to be the one catching the baby. And um, if I hadn't bred a baby with such a massive noggin, uh, that would have been on the car in the cards, but they bring the baby over to me, and I, I like I said, I don't think I've ever held an infant before. And she's all wrapped up and swaddled, and uh, your boy, your boy is a swaddle king these days, um, because for the first like two days we were in the hospital, I think we were there for three nights, I believe. You know, Katie was she had a major abdominal surgery, so she couldn't like pick the baby up out of the bassinet and like so I was I was real hand I was the hands on character in the for the first couple days and so I really learned swaddling and I actually stole a couple blankets from the hospital because I liked their swaddle blankets. Don't tell anybody. But now we don't even use swaddle blankets. We use Velcro swaddles, which I didn't know it was a thing that existed, but it does. And they're the best. So if you're a new parent or planning on having kids, or if you have a friend who's about to have kids, Velcro swaddles. You might not even know what that is. Just Google it and buy it, because that's what they want. What the hell was I talking about? Oh, yeah. Uh, so they bring they bring my baby over to me. And Katie is, like, you know, effectively, like, temporarily paralyzed from the neck down. So she really couldn't do anything. So I was, like, holding the baby at, like, an angle so that they could see one another. Um, but, yeah, it was a pretty intense labor experience it was um it was pretty far out to like be a part of that and to see how that goes it was beautiful that's why parents like don't know how to describe it is because you can't you really can't describe it um i also think that how do i say this there's so little that's expected of fathers in our culture um which boggles my mind um and i think that it leaves men worse off it leaves women worse off and it leaves babies worse off worse off i think that the amount that we expect from fathers is so minimal um in fact even during the labor so when when katie was laboring i you know nurses are coming in and out and this is before the active like this is the baby we're trying to get her out right now. It was during like, we're waiting, checking, seeing what's going on. How do you feel? Blah, blah, blah. So making small talk with the nurses and our midwife, um, I realized that like, there's so many dads that not only sort of miss out on the opportunity to be present by, you know, sitting on the couch or, um, being at their wife's shoulder when they're pushing, um, instead of like helping to hold a leg or like something like that. Um, they also, so like, that's, I think a real missed opportunity to be like engaged with the process. And I think a lot of that comes from fear, um, of like, well, what if I see something that makes me uncomfortable and you know, I never think of my wife differently. Well, that could be a risk, but you know, what you're also risking is the opportunity to see your baby being born, which I think is a greater risk. At least that's the calculus that I ran in my head. And so um, I was as active as possible, um, even though I did have those fears. Like, I think those are normal, rational fears. Um, like, what if something goes wrong and I'm the first to see? Like, all, all these different things. And then 
so that's like the base level of men sort of opting out of participating. Women don't have the option to opt out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's a it's it's a it's skydiving. You know, you jump. However, this shakes out, you're gonna have to pull a shoot, pull a second shoot, pull a third shoot, and like you don't have a choice. You can't get back on the plane. Um, but men, because we don't uh, have that sort of biological expectation, they from having talked to the nurses, they shy away from it. They hide from it. Um, to the extent that, like, some dudes, they told me they told me a story about a guy who, like, brought an Xbox in, played video games while his wife is laboring. Like, you should be talking to your wife. <laughs> Even if it's just, like, boring conversation. Um, or ev- if you choose to watch TV, we I close the cabinets of the television. Because um, that's, that's the kind of guy I am, I am. I'm not a mindless television slob <laughs> no i watch tv I watch tv every day how about that but for this i was like it's just close the tv i don't even want to be able to see the thing because it's just to be a distraction um but e- even if even if that is the choice you make to like let's watch something like let's get our minds off this like let's kind of relax then you should be doing like it shouldn't be her watching you play call of duty do you know what i mean while she's scrolling on her phone or just like waiting for you to engage with her um and then another uh nurse Maybe it was the same nurse, but it doesn't matter. They told me that a guy was like sitting on the ca- wife was put or mom was pushing, which is an in- that's the intensity. That's the intense moment. He's sitting on the couch having a snack. The guy's like eating, eating Chick Fil A sandwiches or something. I'm like, come on, bro, come on. Like in between waffle fries, like you got it, babe. Blah, 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 blah. It's insane. So like that's another layer of this but then another a a layer underneath that is like i've never changed a diaper in my entire life um i don't think i've held had held an infant i definitely hadn't swaddled a baby and i haven't washed a baby i hadn't uh, used the little like the plunger nose plunger thing like all these different things and when we were in there i was like you got i want to learn everything teach me everything um, and like we had, you know, taken online courses and like tried to educate ourselves, but there's an, ex- there's an extent that like, you know, a paid YouTube ad or a paid YouTube video doesn't show you what you like the tactile sensation of having a baby and trying to swaddle them. But, you know, I think a lot of dads, they just opt out and they're like, baby, you got this right. Um, and we expect so little of fathers. So like the base level of what I was doing, which was changing diapers, bringing the baby to my wife who was recovering from a C-section, uh, all these different things like, and asking questions of the nurse and the midwife and the OB. Like, they're like, you guys, you guys are tuned in. And I'm like, dude, this is not, I'm not, this is not, I'm not doing something impressive. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is just very base level stuff. Um, I don't know what that is. I don't know if it's that, um, I don't know what it is about the culture that creates a situation where fathers choose to like opt out. I think fundamentally come coming back to like what my like experience as a teacher is specifically a yoga teacher is that people are very uncomfortable with the present moment and they spend most of their life trying to hide away from the fact that like right now, whatever you're doing, listening to this, you're doing something you're in the moment and you're doing it. And we create all these patterns in our head, these habits in our head, where we jump out of the present moment and distract ourselves from it. Because I think, and I wrote about this on my blog, I think the reason that people are constantly jumping out of the present moment is because the recognition that you're in a moment and you're living your life right now implies that at some point you're going to be dead, which I know is heavy and it's dark. But the implication there is that you are not going to live forever. And if you're in this moment, it's a recognition that all moments go away. And so we live this life where we're constantly distracting ourselves. The baby just woke up. Luckily, Katie's up there to help her out. I'm going to have to wrap this in a second so I can go up. Wouldn't it be very hypocritical of me to be like, you know, fathers, fathers really suck. And then I'm like, uh. Figure it out, lady. I'm going to be bo- podcasting. <laughs> but let me just wrap this point, and then I'll um, 
go see what's upstairs, going on upstairs. We constantly are hiding away from the moment that we're in, and we develop habits, and our culture encourages us to hide away from the present moment because it's it sells, right? Being on your phone, it sells. Like, there's money in that. And so it's not necessarily like a cabal of people trying to distract us from being our best selves. It's just profitable to distract people. And there's a desire for people to become distracted. And if you live your life in a way where you're always hiding away from the present moment, consciously or unconsciously, like, oh, this is uncomfortable. Um, Let me do something else. Or not even recognizing that you're uncomfortable and just reaching for food, drink, phone, whatever. Eventually, the present moment will be foisted upon you. You will find yourself in a situation that you can't avoid being in. You have to be present for And it'll be overwhelming if you haven't practiced just this is what it's like to be in my body right now in this moment. And that's what meditation does. It lets you know, oh, I'm distracted by this. And in your daily life, you'll realize, oh, I'm distracting myself from something. I'm trying to hide away from, you know, a stressful thing at work or boredom, just boredom, being bored. We're not allowed to be bored anymore. And fundamentally what that does are you distracted by the baby crying? I am. Fundamentally, what that does is it creates a system in our head that allows us to consistently hide away from the moment that we're living. So get out there. Live your life. Be an active participant. And practice being in the moment. Meditation, running, climbing, journaling, coloring. I don't know what you do. Find something that keeps you in the present moment because eventually you're going to want to be there for it. There's only so many beautiful moments in life. If we hide away from them, we're not going to have them.